remember taking a picture on your old feature phone a decade ago and posting it on Instagram which was 2.1 megapixel of a blurry mess. We have come a long way from those days and we have people taking breathtaking pictures on smartphone which are almost at par with pro photographers with their fancy and bulky cameras. We all know cameras got better with all the other components on your smartphone. But what goes behind the scenes? What did the smartphone makers do to make their cameras that much better? Let's put aside the DSLR versus the smartphone war and focus on what went into making all cameras good. If you thought that was lame, I am your host Anathan and let's roll. Since we have mentioned feature phones, let's start with the king of feature phones, Nokia. Thanks to companies like Nokia, phone manufacturers started pushing the envelope for good cameras on board. Take the Nokia 808 PureView for example. It was a fairly normal phone for that time. You know, your brick of a Nokia phone running Symbian OS and a mediocre hardware underneath. But what made this one special was the 38 megapixel camera, which was kinda unheard of that time. It was simply nuts to put it short. So story time, our writer actually told me the story about how he bunked his classes to go see the 808 Pure View in the showroom back when it was launched. Such was the impact of the legendary Nokia. We also can't miss the Lumia 1020 if we are talking about cameras, phones and Nokia. With proper ISP and post-processing, I'm sure the hardware has the potential to beat modern fast phone cameras to this day. Next up, we have Apple to thank for making the iPhones and putting damn good cameras in their devices. The iPhones have revolutionized smartphones forever in a lot of ways. The most remarkable and important aspect of them are the cameras. And the 5S was the iPhone that took photography on iPhones to the next level. It had a single 8 megapixel camera that could do it all. It was a 1 by 3 inch sensor which gave it a pixel size of 1.5 microns. These numbers were crazy for the time. The super high pixel size not only helped with the detailed and crisp pictures but also came in clutch for low light scenarios. In fact, the low light performance was so good, it took Android the next two generations of smartphones to catch up with them. There are Android counterparts with similar hardware but there was something with Apple's optimization and color science which produce very good snaps every single time. Don't trust me? You might have heard about IPPA, that is iPhone Photography Awards, which happens every year and one of the winning photos from this year was shot on an iPhone 5S. Whoa! Just take a look at this photo. Amazing, isn't it? Props to the photographer, for it's all about how you use the hardware and skill. But it's really great that an 8 year old phone can still take such good photos. Directors like Stephen Sodenberg and Zack Snyder use iPhones to shoot films say a lot about their video capabilities too. Now, there are a lot of factors that made all these advancements possible and I think it's important to talk about them. The most obvious factor is the increase in sensor size. We all know this, bigger the image sensor, better the image. A bigger image sensor will let in more light and thereby resulting in a more detailed and dynamic range in the final image. For context, we commonly see sensors sized between 1 by 2 and 1 by 1.2 inches. A 1 inch sensor is 4 to 5 times bigger than any of these sensors you find in the later smartphones and while an APS-C sensor would be 16 times bigger. Upgrade this to a full frame sensor and it would be nearly 50 times bigger than a typical smartphone sensor. So the closer we get to the dream of putting a bigger sensor in cameras, the better they are going to get eventually. Speaking of big sensors, you might have recently heard about the Aquas R6 from Sharp, which is going to break the 1 inch sensor mark on smartphones. You might say, Anathan, you are wrong, the Panasonic CM1 was the first smartphone with a 1 inch camera sensor. To that, I'd say, jokes aside, that Panasonic was more like a hybrid camera that was running on Android KitKat back then. Heck, even Panasonic didn't want us to think that it was a smartphone. It was a really capable camera with communication features rather than a smartphone with a great camera sensor. They even launched it under the Lumix branding. Okay now, back to the R6. We are yet to test the cameras on the R6 but I have a good feeling that it will be nothing but great. Next, let's talk about this heavily underrated camera technology called BSI. I'm calling it underrated cause there isn't much customer awareness and it's not a fancy marketing term like triple camera for manufacturers to advertise. A BSI or a backside illuminated sensor is a type of sensor in which the arrangement of the wiring on the sensor is moved back to make more room for the photo drivers. This lets the diode catch more light as a result and gives significantly better results and vastly improved low light capabilities. Simple physics. For example, the Sony Xperia Arc was the first smartphone with this sensor. It was a highly unceremonious and kind of funky looking phone. This was so ahead of its time though. It had an HDMI port. 
we all lost our collective minds with the Xperia Pro having an HDMI port this year. But this phone did it 10 years ago. Okay, now that we have looked enough into the past, let's take a peek at the future and find out what's in store for us. So the flagship chip of this year, Snapdragon 888, adds a third image signal processor with the new Spectra 580 ISP. Basically, the pixels on your camera sensor are sensitive to light between a set of wavelengths. And they don't see any color. It's just the light information they have. It is the ISP's job to add color, adjust exposure, handle the autofocus for you, and do a lot of crazy work behind the scenes. And what's crazy about this is, you can simultaneously record from the third camera now. You can practically have three different angles of the same shot this way. And that's not the best thing about adding this new ISP. With three ISPs on board, you can pipe all of that data from a single sensor to do a lot of interesting things. Previously, with two ISPs on board with the Snapdragon 865, it could do two gigapixels per second throughput, which is bonkers. In layman terms, that's 2 billion pixels per second, and this year it has been bumped up to 2.7 gigapixels per second. Now, you might wonder, I'm only taking like 108 megapixel photos at best. Why would I need all this throughput for? That seems overkill, right? To that, I'd say zero shutter lag. And we are gonna refer to it as ZSL from now on. So you might have shot with the 108 megapixel camera. They are not exactly devoid of shutter lag. In fact, I remember the shutter lag on S20 Ultra being quite noticeable. That's not all there is to it. Whenever you would be shooting with a high-res sensor like this, the quality difference from the viewfinder to the actual photo would be day and night. That's because even with a data throughput of 2 gigapixels per second, it's not enough to preview the full resolution image in real time. Depending on your screen refresh rate, it's either 60 or 120 frames, and to preview a 108 megapixel image at full resolution is quite impossible at this data rate. So the easy way out of this is outputting the preview in 1 by 4th of its resolution. That's the reason you have the quality difference between the viewfinder preview and the final image. Even with 2.7 gigapixels of data throughput per second, it's not enough to achieve an image with ZSL. Right now, the most we can do is 84 megapixel ZSL image, which is a significant bump from 64 megapixel ZSL of the previous gen processor. To do a 109 megapixel ZSL image, you would need a data throughput of 3.2 gigapixels per second. That's pretty near in the future from what I can see, but with Samsung announcing a new 200 megapixel sensor, this is gonna be a never ending race. The next big thing about the triple ISPs is something called computational HDR. It's a lot different from the HDR video standards we usually talk about, like HDR10 or Dolby Vision HDR. What happens with the computational HDR is what the camera takes two pictures of every frame. One picture would be underexposed to preserve the highlight details and the other one would be overexposed photo which would bring out the shadow details. When you merge both of these photos, you get an HDR output with very good dynamic range. This was something Apple has implemented in their iPhones for almost three years now and this would help restore some balance on the Android side of things. And another really cool feature the new ISP unlocks is smoother transition between cameras. That is, when you zoom in using different cameras on your smartphone, it's going to be smoother movement and going to look seamless thanks to better autofocus and auto exposure. You know what else could be seamless? Hitting the like button and subscribe buttons back to back. Go on, do it. Now that you have done with it, uh, let us know what you felt about this video and my lame response. This is Anandan from FTJ and I'll definitely catch you in the next one. Ciao. Nerd!